Hi, I'm Vipin Bharathan. I've been involved in Hyperledger since it started, probably in 2015, 2016. And I'm the chair of two important or foundational groups in Hyperledger. One is the Hyperledger uh, Capital Markets, and the other is the uh, Identity Working Group. And this was prompted, this particular talk was prompted by all the news about software supply chain and the intersection of the software supply chain with the open source community. And we'll go through this presentation in the beginning, just exploring the software supply chain and the software supply chain security. Then uh, we talk about open source and what we can do in Hyperledger uh, repositories. And I can also talk about what we do um, in Hyperledger repositories. I've demonstrated some issues to people. Um, anyway, uh, the reason this is called the poisoned well is because in ancient times, the well was a common uh, place where people would come to get water. Everybody, it was a shared resource. It was the commons. Um, and I have to say that once the well is poisoned, then everybody gets poisoned which is uh, a metaphor for open source. So we have to uh, talk about the software supply chain and the attack surface of the software supply chain um, and the trends in the software supply chain compromises, evaluation of data on actual attacks, the solar winds hack, a deep dive and a special case of open source software and finally mitigation. Uh, equal time will not be spent on each one of these. Uh, you know, some of the items get more priority than others. Um, I don't think uh, we need to talk about this particular uh, problem here, this particular uh, issue. Uh, I mean, um, set of uh, things that we need to talk about, which is, Software is ubiquitous, software is evolving fast, and software is complex. Uh, that, we, that much we can agree on. Uh, consequences of this uh, phenomenon are that most enterprises use commercial of the self uh, software or commercial open source software like, for example, uh, what is in Red Hat, there is a lot of reuse being done and outsourcing. Basically, it is a phenomenon of outsourcing complexity, right? There was a, you know, this is not new. There was a thought experiment from Ken Thompson in 1984 the real source is a Air Force, Air Force critique, uh, now obscure. Ken Thompson is of course the uh, creator of the original Unix and the C compiler. And if you had been writing C, you would have read Thompson and Ritchie's C programming. The C programming language, which, is, which was the seminal text of the 80s and 90s. In this talk, uh, Ken Thompson showed in code how the C compiler can be hacked to insert a Trojan horse, leaving no traces in the source. Basically, he did that by creating the source um, well, the C compiler itself is written in C. This is the beauty of the whole thing. Uh, so the C compiler 
source was changed to insert the Trojan horse. And then he removes the source after compiling the, C comp the new C compiler, which contains the Trojan horse. And all traces of this hack disappear from the, um, from the source code. So the compiler and the source code do not correspond to each other. Of course, as Ken said, the level of, as the level of programming gets lower uh, and especially in microcode in those days, microcode, but in these days, these days with uh, IOT devices and so on, that kind of um, well-installed Trojan horse inside a microcode will be very, very almost impossible to detect. So this should send shivers down everybody's spine because it means that if the microcode or, or the IoT device is hacked, there is no way to find out what Trojan horse lurks inside each one of them. Uh, there are ways in which uh, we can uh, detect this mostly by the behavior of the component. And these days when you have AI monitoring for security, you can probably figure out that one of the components are misbehaving. Um, so you go to the SolarWinds hack, which was very uh, prominently in the news just recently. SolarWinds is a company that manufactures a product called Orion. Orion is used for many uh, administrative tasks all over the place. The point is, it is used across more than 18,000 enterprises and many sensitive um, federal and local agencies. I mean, we are talking about the US Treasury Department. You're talking about, yeah, you know, even probably parts of the um, Defense Department. So the reach is tremendous. Of once you get into the SolarWinds uh, product, uh, Orion, then you can get into all these other products. So the initial hack is very innocuous, meaning they probably use some kind of an account compromise using a uh, using phishing or something else to get into the into the IT management product build um, tooling. The details are there in the references that I provide in the end. Basically, it monitors the running processes for msbuild.exe. I have done this myself, meaning I'm not saying I did it for the purpose of hacking the build, but in order to, um, you know, to detect a running program is very easy. And then to replace one of the source files. Uh, so these are not complex hacks. Thing is, the accreted uh, value of the of the hack is tremendous because the scale of the compromise uh, is magnified by the use of Orion in multiple uh, places. And several uh, safeguards were added to the Sunspot. Sunspot is the uh, actual name, code name given by the analyst to avoid the builds from failing due to this inserted uh, code. And uh, the beauty of the thing is it's similar to what Ken Thompson did, which is you make the change, you do the compilation, 
as soon as that file is comp compiled, you back out the change and you restore the old file. So no traces of the hack remain in the source files that are on SolarWinds, um, you know, SolarWinds servers. And I said it was used extensively in enterprises. Now, um, so any supply chain hack can happen at various points in the design. I mean, in the, in the process, in the build process, in the implementation process, in the iterative testing process, in the deployment process, in the updates and maintenance process. SolarWinds, of course, is uh, Sunburst is the code name was in account um, in the account access process, but it can happen at any point in this uh, in this build chain, build and deploy uh, chain, um, which is very uh, interesting. Out of the eighteen thousand, only a small portion of the victims were chosen. And then they compromise the using this service, uh, the identity and access management software from Azure uh, were compromised to gain access to many email accounts, including many sensitive email accounts. It was a cloud based compromise as well as a sign of a state actor with time, money, patience and discipline which means after the initial penetration, they stayed quiet for a long, long time before they activated some of these uh, changes in the builds. Then they exfiltrated, uh, exfiltrated meaning, took out the data from these, um, from these compromised accounts, they used only US-based servers, what appear to be US-based servers through VPNs or whatever, uh, to exfiltrate the data, to take the data out and store it. And they did it in a way that it would not raise any red flags, uh, including making sure that the traffic from the compromised servers followed the usual patterns. That means not too much data was pushed out in bursts. They slowly filtered it out. And the major point that should be noted is the software supply chain attack lasted months and it was a major, major strategic failure for the US. Obviously, uh, nobody knows exactly who did it, but all fingers uh, seem to point at Russia. Uh, but you don't need this kind of a state actor to compromise the so software supply chain. Um, you just need somebody who has the money and the willingness to attack the software ch supply chain. Now, that brings us to the open source world. The open source world has more than 1.5 trillion downloads uh, in 2020, a high performance, high per performers who use open source detect and remediate open source software vulnerabilities 26 times faster. High performers are 51% more likely to create a software bill of materials, which we'll get into in a minute. And there is a 430% year on year growth in cyber attacks targeting open source software projects. Nearly 40% of all NPM packages 
rely on code with known vulnerabilities. On our average, there are 38 known open source software vulnerabilities per application. You know, all these numbers, they are tremendously um, sort of, they create uh, a situation in which we are, we should be very vigilant when we release open source software, especially blockchain based, blockchain uh, based open source software, you know, blockchain frameworks on open source software, which is the business of Hyperledger. Um, whenever they talk about exemplary projects, they say they are, you know, 530 times faster on adapting dependencies. So the aim that we have should be to become a high performer, to become an exemplary project when we have a project inside Hyperledger, um, our software needs to be among the high performers. And it's not just um, small companies that use open source software. We can see that 373,000 average enterprise downloads of open source software components um, happen per year. Many of the uh, very sensitive financial applications, many others use open source software extensively, even though the people inside the enterprise are not even aware of it. So uh, the aim for us should be to get to be uh, high performers. Uh, the defense um, of this software starts, uh, you know, so we are talking about now about defense, starts with a software bill of materials. A software bill of materials is, is like a bill of materials for any product. That means you break down the product into its components and the components are further break, broken down into their components and so on until you reach the raw material stage or at least the material that is very simple. Uh, so this is a known way of analyzing any product and the logistics of uh, supply chain for a normal product. So the software bill of materials is very similar to the software bill of materials for a industrial product, actual physical object or physical product like a laptop. Laptop has probably thousands, hundreds of thousands of components which are sourced from all over the world. Um, so first of all, this cannot be done by humans. I mean, maybe you can try, but the software bill of materials should be created using a software component analysis tools. Also monitoring and response have to be as close as possible. And of course, after the hack, uh, there was an executive order uh, by President Biden that asked NIST to develop a way to tackle the uh, supply chain security. NIST had already had many meetings, many uh, ways of uh, dealing with supply chain attacks. But obviously the breach showed that they are nowhere near to securing the software uh, supply chain. So this is, has to be taken up with the most urgency. Uh, and Hyperledger repositories could uh, manage the software bill of materials through a database. Um, 
I tried to automate uh, the uh, SCA, the so software component analysis using a tool directly linked to the GitHub repository. And we have to rebuild and redeploy the project if any of the dependencies have re reported vulnerabilities. And we also have to communicate to users saying that our original build had vulnerabilities and there is a pathway to upgrade once we've, uh, once we've created the new build. But uh, in the universe of uh, software, supply chain attacks, this is only one, one vector, but it's an important vector. So I'm going to share what is called the crop circle diagram from the software bill of materials uh, practice in supply chain, software supply chain. It all points to what should be stored for the component identity uh, related to the component identity. Uh, there should be authors, there should be a license, there should be a formulation, uh, which is basically a build system, uh, which is uh, uh, how the component is built, uh, what is the usage description, uh, and what are the known vulnerabilities and what vulnerabilities do they expose, the protocol and the format, and the components that the compo uh, this component depends on. So as you can see, I have shown this with the dashed line that um, that this can be one to many. That means the component identity can point to so many other components and each of those components can point to others. So there is an explosion in the dependency tree uh, from this component to the other components. And um, let, let's, um, let's talk about what I have done in terms of uh, what I've run. I have uh, created branches in many of the, uh, um, many of the uh, projects uh, in Hyperledger, my own private branch, but of course, since it's public software, I can do that. And then I can, uh, I plugged in uh, two things. One is the white source bolt uh, so this only handles the known vulnerabilities because uh, basically what it's doing is it's comparing uh, what the product uses. First, first it does a component analysis, software component analysis and finds out all the components. And for each component if, uh, and uh, version, uh, if there is a particular vulnerability reported in the press, or uh, not the press, sorry, in the CBE, which is the, uh, which is the place where they collect all the vulnerabilities uh, of the software. And if that uh, piece of software, the component is uh, available on that, p on that uh, website, then um, it reports it as an issue. So I ran this against uh, some of the components uh, in uh, Hyperledger, some of the projects. Um, some of them picked up uh, quite a few vulnerabilities, serious, uh, medium, and so on. So I presented uh, that fact to the projects. Uh, and we have to set up a methodology by which we can mitigate uh, and uh, upgrade to the latest version. When we are doing this, there are a couple of problems. One problem is uh, the problem of false positives. That is the software component analysis is reporting a problem where none exists. Uh, that can cause the developers to ignore, uh, ignore the, uh, you know, the fact that a compromise was detected. Uh, we have to somehow configure the white source bolt, which is what I used, uh, or any other product uh, to only report 
things that above a certain threshold, above, let's say, uh, at least medium vulnerability. So if you think about this uh, uh, possibility that you're using a vulnerable component, what is the problem? The problem is that you are no longer, uh, your software that you created inside Hyperledger is no longer just dependent on the security of your own software, but it is dependent on the security of the components that you used. And any one of those vectors can be used to attack a user of your software, uh, compromise them, get into their, um, their servers, similar to what happened to uh, Orion, uh, that piece of software by uh, SolarWinds. And uh, we also see that that can then spread all over the place, depending on the uh, reach of the software. So obviously, all you need to do is to compromise, let's say, solar winds, and then using that to compromise the identity and access management system inside Microsoft Azure. Then you have the whole web-based platform of you know, multiple organizations that can be breached. Um, so for us, what we can do is a first level defense of figuring out which components we are using that are problematic and fix them. I've already started a, uh, a blog. Uh, I mean, I'm going to set out a blog to Hyperledger and also communicate with the maintainers and the security uh, practitioners inside Hyperledger uh, and maybe we will come up with a process and a workflow to do this uh, component software component analysis on a rig rigorous way and find out how we can fix the uh, software that we are building and make it as safe as possible. Another uh, fact is that the earlier you have this practice of software hygiene, the better it is going to be for the final product because finding and fixing problems just before you're about to release production version is not uh, going to be easy compared to inculcating that practice right from the get-go. Anyway, thank you all for listening. I think I have come to the end of my 30-minute talk. And in case you want to contact me, uh, my email address is vip at dlt.nyc which is uh, on every one of these slides. Actually, it's not, but the only my website. Uh, but I want to also share with you the references that I have here. And I am thankful to many of these, uh, many of much of this literature um, in order to do my research and to come up with practical solutions. Thank you again.